Okay, let's get going. Welcome to Casual Friday. So uh, one announcement, one is I have a, an article in the new Interweave Knits Summer 2018 on jogless cast on and bind offs in the round. Uh, and I will put a link below, they usually put my articles on the Interweave blog soon after the magazine is published. So whenever that happens, I'll put that in the link below, but also you'll be able to find a link to it from the Rocks Rocks group on Ravelry once I find out what the, what the link is. I've been looking for it. I don't think it's up yet, but otherwise you can just get it from the magazine. Okay. So second thing I wanted to update you, um, last week I was showing you this blanket that I was working on. Um, and so I have of the three sections, it's a three section blanket. I've got two and a half sections done. So I've joined the first section to the second section and you can see that kind of horizontal dark green line across the middle. And what I used was kind of an interesting technique. I think I'm going to do video on it. And when I joined the third section to the section, second section, I'm going to do a video on it. It's a three needle I cord bind off. So it takes, the three needle bind off and the I-cord bind off and it combines them together as a way to create an interesting join. Um, I, when I did a version of this blanket for my niece for her wedding, it was much larger and a little bit different, uh, different colors and different sequences of, of these um, knit and pearl garter sections. Uh, I came up with this, this join and I wondered if anyone had done it before because I wanted to make sure that I was doing it in a way that made sense and that if someone else had figured it out, um, maybe there would be a different way to do it. Um, and so obviously other people had figured it out before, but I, the way they figured it out was the same way I figured it out. So uh, I'll do a video on that sometime in the near future because I think it's kind of a cool technique and I think there are other applications for it. The reason I even wanted to do something like this is because I know that once I get a third of the way through a blanket that's about as big of a piece of fabric that I as I want to work with. So for my niece's blanket I wanted to, I planned from the beginning that I'd work it in three sections and that I would somehow join those three sections together. And that was my solution, um, was to come up with this I-cord, three needle I-cord bind off. And um, I think it's kind of neat. So um, I'll keep you guys posted. So I want to talk a little bit about perfectionism and um, it's taken me a little while to get going on this video apparently because I wanted it to be perfect. So I'm just going to accept that it's not going to be perfect and I'm just going to, to talk about it. Talk about perfectionism in general and um, the way I've experienced it, how it's affected me in different ways, in different areas of my life. And, um, and in my knitting and how, what I've done to protect um, my knitting and to make sure that I continue uh, to to learn and grow and and to mostly that I knit. I I think all of us have some degree of perfectionism that we display in different areas of, of our lives. So I wanted to talk about some of the ways that I have been perfectionistic in ways that were not really helpful <laughs> to me, uh, what I learned from that, and then how I have taken those things that I've learned in other areas of my life and applied it uh, to my knitting and what uh, I expect from my knitting and what I learned from my knitting and what I can produce with my knitting. So one of the major areas of my life that I have felt was like uh, really important to do well was um, parenting. So I, you know, I was brought up by a single mother and I think she did a really remarkable job. She'll say that we raised ourselves and that we were really good kids, we were easy kids to raise, and it's probably um, true to a large extent. But she did a lot of things right. 
So when I became a mother, I, it was like this overwhelming responsibility that you have, you know, not just to keep this infant alive, but then to raise them into a functioning member of society and how it, how easy it would be to really blow it. So I, I, I remember I was talking to my mom and like, oh, I'd be so worried about not doing something right. Not, and, um, and failing. And she, she told me two pieces of advice, um, that I just immediately, um, took hold of and, uh, found to be a relief to hear and f- found that it made me much feel much better about being a parent. The first one was, um, whatever you think it is that you're doing wrong, is not the thing that your kid is going to be mad at you about. In other words, you're going to screw up as a parent, but it's not going to be in the way that you think you're screwing up. (laughs) It's going to be something that you didn't even think about. You just did, and your kid is going to resent you for it. So I thought, okay, (laughs) well, uh, just, you know, do the best it can. The other thing was, is she said, Roxanne, you do not want to be perfect. What kind of an example is that to set for your child? And I thought, oh, that's true. Because if I were perfect, if I somehow managed to achieve perfection as a parent, and that's the role model that my kids have is that a perfect parent, then they're supposed to be perfect. And I'm not expecting them to be perfect. So those two pieces of advice, I think were the best bits of parenting advice. I could have, you know, gone without any other advice about parenting and that would have been fine. So I have a degree in communications and writing. So I have a degree in writing. um, And from the time I was young, I wanted to be an author. I thought, you know, I wanted to be a writer. I thought for a while I wanted to be a journalist. Um, When I was uh, after my kids were born, I decided I really wanted to try fiction writing. And I joined writers groups. I would go to uh, workshops. I read a lot of books on craft. I joined a study group where we analyzed uh, books for plot structure. Uh, I had joined a critique group. Uh, I had um, some of my friends in the critique group, you know, they sold their first books. I had online friends who were New York Times bestselling authors. I had a lot of writer friends. I was just immersed in the world of fiction writing. But I got to the point where I lost my writing voice, couldn't write an email that sounded like me. And and a lot of it had to do with how much time I spent reading about writing, talking about writing, researching writing, and but not actually writing. And it was just, it was this incredible um, mismatch in the, in, in the balance. Uh, I, so, you know, I, I know a lot, I know a lot about writing and I know a lot about good writing and I know a lot about, I became very good at, at, at being, um, at critiquing and not interfering with another writer's voice. I mean, I, there are a lot of skills that I learned from all of this, but what I was not able to do was to uh, finish a book and and I couldn't get out of this cycle of perfectionistic thinking and the internal editor on my shoulder telling me it was bad it was bad it was bad I knew intellectually that in order to be a better writer I had to keep writing but I couldn't write so when I was really heavily into this writing I had kind of taken this knitting hiatus I, I just hadn't been knitting very much I didn't need that as a creative outlet because I had writing so when I came back to knitting, I wa- it was specifically because I wanted to remember what it was like to feel creative for the sake of being creative. But I am also at my core an information seeker. So I love learning. And, I, and so that was part of the whole problem that I had with the fiction writing was I wanted to learn as much as I could, but I was neglecting the learning by doing. So with knitting, I wanted to make sure that I protected, uh, I protected the knitting. A lot of my, my published writer friends always talked about, they had this mantra, protect the work, protect the work. And which was, you know, a warning to not let all this outside 
um, influence interfere with the actual writing. But that I was way past that with my writing. So with my knitting, when I came back to it, I realized there was this incredible online internet knitting community that I had never known about. It kind of exploded during the time I was on my hiatus. And um, I never had known any knitters in real life other than the people who worked at the yarn shops where I bought my yarn. I had a five minute conversation with them. So I didn't have any anybody else who knew anything about knitting that I could talk to ever before. But when I came back to knitting, I found this online com community. I found knitters who lived in my immediate area. I could go to knitting groups. I could watch other people knitting, see how everybody did things differently. I, um, I met other knitters online. I was uh, found out about the master hand knitting program pretty quickly. And the idea of how much you could learn about knitting really appealed to me. And so I ordered it right away. And within two weeks, I could see myself heading toward that cliff of perfectionism and I wanted to protect the knitting. So I pushed the Master Hand Knitting Program to the side for a while and just let myself enjoy the knitting. And, and I've kept to that. It's been, I think, 13 years now since I came back to knitting. And um, anytime I felt like, like my perfectionism was interfering, I would take a break from it. But I also have this um, habit of this habit of with my knitting projects where I can't stand to work on anything more than three weeks. So I think that that, that has been really helpful. Like with a novel, you can't do that. It's a long project. You can't work on a novel for three weeks and then come back to it. But a knitting project, you can. They're, sometimes they're big projects, but they're, they're, they're just a little bit more contained than a novel is. So I, I've been able to protect the work. And another thing that I have learned my, about myself and I've talked about previously as well is that um, when I'm knitting gifts, those are products. When I'm knitting for myself, it's often a process knit. It's something I'm knitting in order to learn something about or just for the experience. So a lot of times I can get 80% of the way through it and I've learned everything I needed to learn from that experience, I don't really care if I have the finished item or not. Sometimes I'll go ahead and finish it. But but my goal is to learn and to accumulate experience and context for, um, for when I knit something in the future. So it isn't always about the product for me. Um, but that 80%, that there's something about 80% where it's, it's enough for me. And I noticed, I noticed that that's true in other projects that I do. Like when I make my techniques videos, I have a goal for what it is I'm trying to communicate. Like I'm trying to communicate this specific technique and I want to make sure I cover certain points. And if my hair doesn't look so great in the video, <laughs> or if the sound is a little wonky or the lighting could have been better, eh, it could have been better. But I don't like retape everything. I don't redo it. I don't try to make it a Hollywood production in order to upload the technique videos. So, so if I'm 80% of the way to what I would consider the perfect technique video, um, then I feel good enough about it to upload it and then move on to the next thing. And in the meantime, I've learned something about uh, teaching, uh, about the technique itself, about editing, about using my the my whole production um, suite of camera, tripods, lights, and all of that. I've learned something every time, and that ultimately is really important to me. Another aspect of perfectionism is that there's a taste gap. So Ira Glass talked about this years ago I, um, in a video where you're really interested in something, you're really obsessed and enthusiastic about, about something. And so you're throwing yourself in, into it and it's not as good as you want it to be or that you think it could be. And that's because you know you have good taste and you know what you want to be able to do, but what you're actually able to do is this. And you can't get to that until you practice and work and just do it over and over and over again, that 80%, get to that 80% and then move on to the next thing, get to that 80%, move on to the next thing. And pretty soon that taste gap is going to close. Although 
in my experience, the, case, the taste gap just kind of moves because as you get better uh, at something, then your taste gets better as well. Um, but so just accept that that's all part of perfectionism and wanting to be better, that, 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 you, that you embrace the fact that you want to be better and that you will get better the more you work and the more you do, the more you knit, the more you write, the more you parent, any of it you'll get better. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago, maybe called Blink. And he talked about like people who have certain levels of expertise and, and how much time does it take to actually learn um, to become an expert at something. And I think his book said something like 10,000 hours, but really it isn't that you can um, say knit for 10,000 hours and be an expert knitter. Like you couldn't knit dishcloths for 10,000 hours and be an expert at anything other than knitting dishcloths. You have to keep learning while you're doing it. So you have to keep learning from your, from, from the whole process. You can't just keep practicing the same thing over and over and over again and expect, and expect to be better. There was a story that I heard a few years ago, and I don't know if it was from my daughter who was taking ceramics and it was her teacher who told her if I read it from somewhere else, but there's this story about uh, a teacher who uh, was teaching a pottery class and she, and he or she divided up the group into two, into two halves. And one half of the class was told to um, research and study best practices for pots and all this kind of thing. And they had to produce one perfect pot uh, at the end of the semester and then there would be a competition for whose pot was the most perfect. And then the other half of the class was just told that they had to knit, a, a knit that they had to, to make a lot of pots. And then at the end of the semester, they could pick their best pot uh, and put it in a competition if they wanted. And so, of course, the point of the story was at the end of the semester, the people with the best pots were the ones who had been practicing making pots all semester long and had made a hundred pots or something. And they had done so many things and tried so many different things, big pots, little pots, complex, simple. They, they had worked and worked and worked at it and built their muscle memory for technique. Um, that by the end they had all of these pots and they had some just amazing things where the people who studied about making pots and researched it and how did, how was the right way to do it and only had one attempt at it just didn't have the practice and the skill set and the experience to produce anything that was anywhere near as good as the people who had um, thrown hundreds of pots. So sometimes you'll see on Ravelry these new enthusiastic knitters who have just discovered the craft and they want to learn all the things and they have access to all the things and they're trying to accumulate everything that they can, all every piece of knowledge they can about knitting socks, every type of heel, every type of toe, every type of tip or technique for producing the best heel flaps or the best graft or the best, you know, whatever, um, before they ever knit a sock. And and it kind of reminds me of that that whole scenario about the pottery class. It's like it and and my issues with writing was that you have to do it. So you there's certainly there's a, a certain amount of information that you can accumulate before you knit your first sock, for example, um, that can make that sock fit reasonably well. But it's going to take knitting a lot of socks and discovering, well, what techniques do I like? What heel fits me best? What modifications do I need to knit, knit um, make in order to make it fit well? And how much negative ease do I really like? How firm a, a gauge do I really like in the socks that, that, that I wear for on my feet? You can't know that without knitting them. So I appreciate the wanting to know all of the information, but I worry, I worry about these knitters. I, I worry about them and I want them to just, just go knit a sock. It doesn't have to fit anybody, just knit a sock. And then once you've done that, you're gonna knit another sock and another, or maybe you hate knitting socks and then you won't ever wanna knit one again. So you can't get better at the knitting only by watching YouTube videos um, or, or reading articles or reading posts or reading books. You have to actually do it. You, you, that's part of the learning is doing it. One of the things I think that is really hard for knitters um, it, and it's hard for people in general. I don't 
know that this is a female thing in particular, but I think a lot of women have this issue is not accepting a compliment. Like, oh, I love your haircut. Um, oh, or I love your, your, your shirt. And, and the response is not thank you. It's, oh, uh, oh, this is, this is an old shirt. I've had this for three years. Oh, I got it on sale at whatever. And instead, and nowhere in the response is the phrase, thank you. So when I, when I um, first came back to knitting and, and I was in these knitting groups and I had learned, I'd heard this from my writer friends too, not about writing, but just about compliments in general, is that when someone pays you a compliment, the response that is, thank you, and then you shut up. Um, you, maybe you'll have a conversation about whatever it was that you complimented, but the important thing, the important first response is, thank you. Um, because if what you do instead is respond with, like knitters do sometimes, they'll say, oh, I love your sweater. Oh yeah, I miscrossed the cable here and uh, I, I bound off wrong here and, and my seam is wonky here. What you're saying to the person is, you are wrong to compliment me and let me tell you all the reasons why you're wrong. So we have to learn how to just say thank you. So I was thinking about, about this um, perfectionism thing because last weekend when I went to Yarnover to teach on Friday, um, they had a teacher's, it's called the teacher's dinner. And so all the teachers were there, it was like 15 teachers, but anybody in the guild who wanted to come could come. And Bristol Ivy was giving a talk on what inspires us as knitters. And um, so it's, you know, the cocktail hour, but he's mingling around. And Sally Melva walked by, I was talking to a friend of mine in the guild, and Sally Melva walked by in this kind of gray lace uh, tunic. And as she walked by, we saw in the back, there was this like vent, like a, an, a V or, and I guess it's because it's an A-line. So it's sort of an A-line vent in the back that was in the same lace pattern, but it was red. It was so gorgeous. So we're staring at it, but then she turns around, <laughs> then she turned around and came and talked to us. Um, so we couldn't stare at the back of her sweater anyway. She's chatting with us and we were talking about different things. And she said to me, oh, that's, you know, she's complimenting me on the sweater I was wearing. It was this turquoise, greenish, bluish, turquoise, uh, hand-painted yarn. And she's uh, complimenting me on it. And I said, thank you. So I got that part right. And then she said, and she kept looking at it. She goes, oh, and there's no pooling. And so I lifted up my arm and I said, <laughs> with my fist, and she's like, no, 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 don't tell people, don't point it out. And if that's a really hard, hard lesson to learn, especially for me, because I'm so fact oriented. So it's more like, no, no, you need to have the facts. I think one of the, the things that really, really brought home to me that perfection is not the same to everyone. Like I am intimately aware with ev aware of whatever it is I have knit and where the problems are and where I would like things to be better. But the person who's looking at me wearing the sweater is not aware of those things. They're aware of the whole the whole thing. They're not they're not aware of anything else and they're aware of the, sort of the statement that 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 item um, makes. And, um, and I finally, finally understood that um, because of two things that I own that I love. One of them is the sweater. I haven't, I didn't wear this year. I, was, I had forgot about it. It was in the back of my closet, but it's a, it's this gray cashmere uh, cable sweater. It's kind of short. It kind of sits at the waist, not cropped, but it sits a little bit higher. Um, and it's a cardigan, but it has a snap. It has snaps on it instead of um, instead of buttonholes. And I and I always liked it. And I liked it so much that one time I laid it down on the kitchen table to take a look at it because I decided I wanted to uh, knit myself another one in another color. And so I was I was looking at gauge. I was counting stitches, and I was deciphering. Um, this cable on the front. Well, it's this, it's this diamond one with the bobbles, but it was, I was looking at the one along the front here, right here. And, um, 
and I was charting it out, you know, like, and, and I realized that this cable that's right on the front, right next to the opening, uh, was miscrossed. It's a miscrossed cable. And actually the cable was miscrossed in a couple of different places <laughs> that, that now that I look at it and I see, um, and it's the kind of miscrossing that I used to point out on a cable uh, sweater that I had. As soon as someone would compliment me, I'd go, oh, here's where, I, and people couldn't see it. Uh, same, same problem with this sweater. Never saw it, never noticed it, don't care. Uh, it's still a great sweater. So that was the first time I thought, oh, something can be imperfect and not noticeable. Then the second thing um, was this, this necklace that I have here, we, we got when we were on a trip to, um, to Italy, we're in Venice and they have, um, this Murano glass factory on this Island there. And then, but in Venice and they have all these little shops where they have jewelry and stuff. And we were in this shop and my mother-in-law said to me, I really like to buy you uh, a necklace. So pick out any, anything you want in here and I'll buy it for you. So I bought this, I bought this necklace. I just, I just love it. I, anytime I've worn it, I've gotten complimented on it. And I was getting ready to put it on one day and I just, you know, I was getting ready to, you know, open up the, the clasps. Um, so I had it laying on the table in front of me and I just was sort of admiring it. And I was looking at how the beads were all put together and how it all went together. And, and I realized right here, there's a gold bead and right here, there is no gold bead and every other, um, one of these squares has a gold bead on either side of it. So this is also imperfect. Now, I don't believe um, that it was made imperfectly um, on purpose. <laughs> I know a lot of times pe uh, people will claim that it, um, the Amish will put in a, um, a special square in the quilt that's imperfect because only God is perfect and um, Somebody told some Amish women this story, I asked them once if this were true, and they're like, we make enough mistakes, um, we don't have to do it on purpose. And I had read something on a quilter's forum once years ago about this woman who had, um, who had brought her quilt to like the Quilters Guild and said, oh, and I made one square, you know, the mistake square, I guess they call it. See if, you, see if you can find the mistake. And, and so they found five mistakes. So she had made plenty on her own. So the main takeaway from all this is that if somebody compliments you on your knitting or anything, whatever, your hair, your glasses, whatever, smile and say thank you. And the second thing is that 80% is good enough. It really is. Um, because if you get, if you get 80% of the way to what you really think, if you get 80% of the way to what you think is a hundred percent perfect, it's good enough. And you will learn more with your next 80% and you will learn more with your next 80%. All that will accumulate. And then over time, um, whatever your 80% is now is going to be way better than what your 80% was before. If you, if you try to get to hundred percent every single time, that's actually going to slow you down and you won't get as you won't get any, you won't get better as, as fast as you could. If you just keep moving on, moving on and learning, moving on, learning, moving on and learning. Um, it's just, uh, and then let it go. It's not perfect. Let it go. <laughs> it's also important to realize what your goal is anytime you approach a project of any kind, whether it's a knitting project or some other project in your life. What is your, what is your actual goal? Like for me, uh, when I was writing, I tried to tell myself that my goal was to, to finish a, uh, a book. But really, my goal was I want to be published. I want to, I want to, I want to be published. That is not the same thing as, and you can't be published unless you finish the book. So the, my goal should have been finish the book, but I kept looking, how can I make this publishable? What makes this publishable? Um, making those comparisons and not just not protecting the work and focusing on the work. 
one of the things that I, I see that gets pa that's paired with uh, perfectionism is procrastination. So that's part of that whole research and um, studying and thing is that you're, oh, you, you want to learn how to make it perfect and that's how you can procrastinate because uh, the longer you procrastinate, the longer it can that your idea of whatever it is you want to do is going to stay perfect in your head because as soon as you start doing it, it's never like what you imagine in your head. And the problem is no one else has seen what's what's in your head. So whatever you do produce is uh, better than, um, than, than not having produced something. So, and you can't make something better until you've made something to begin with. So you can't correct it or make it better or revise it or do a different version of it until you've done it the first time. So whether that's perfecting a technique or, um, or, tr or knitting a sweater for the first time or socks or gloves or whatever it is that you, you can't, you can't figure out what a better technique is until you've tried the, tried one technique. And then you can say, well, I would, I'd really rather this fit this other way. And what's the problem with it? Why is it fitting this way? Is it and not enough stitches? Is it the gauge is wrong? Is it that I have big fingers? Is it, you know, what is the actual problem? And so how can I fix that next time? And that was something that I really had to learn too. I, um, I once wore a new sweater that I just finished. I'd spent a couple of different winters working on it. It was this cabled, heavily cabled Aaron sweater and it was worked from the top down and the last thing you do is pick up around the the neck and um and do the ribbing for the neck and I'd done done the ribbing I folded it down then I sewed it down and I decided it was just a little bit too short and then the neck was a little bit too too wide for me and I didn't want to take it out it was finally done I didn't want to take it out and I wore it over to a friend's house who's a knitter and she said that is a state fair blue ribbon sweater. And I said, no, it's not, you know, the neck's too wide. And you know, this, and she's like, no, no. She said, so next time you make a sweater, you know that you want your neck to be a little narrow and you do that next time. But the way it is right now, nobody's going to know or care that you think it's a little too wide for you that, you know, it's a beautiful sweater. So it's like, oh, okay. Also, if Sally Melville compliments you on your sweater, just say thank you and shut up.